Hey there, working listeners. Before we get started, I want to let you know about a story coming up a little later in the show. It's from our partners at Macy's. For over a decade, Macy's has partnered with The Trevor Project, the leading suicide prevention organization for LGBTQ young people. From June 1st to 30th, you can support The Trevor Project by rounding up your Macy's in-store purchase or donating online. Stick around to hear from Sophie from The Trevor Project. If I felt like there was an abundance of other shows that did interviews well the way I liked them, I wouldn't do Talk Easy. How many shows do you listen to and you go, Jesus, they just said three interesting things. Ask about one of them. Welcome back to Working. I'm June Thomas. And I'm Cameron Drews. Cameron? Yes. <laughs> it's our, it's good grief. As our producer, you're always in our Zoom recordings, but you usually mute your microphone and turn off your video once we hosts start talking. But not today, because this week you were in the host chair. Who did you talk with? Whose voice did we hear at the top of the show? I know. I'm, I'm coming out from behind the curtain again. <laughs> uh, the voice we heard at the top of the show belongs to Sam Fragoso. He's the host of the podcast Talk Easy with Sam Fragoso. Okay. And why did you want to talk with him? So for a long time, I've wanted to interview someone about interviewing. Mm, mm -hmm. And that's for two reasons. Number one is very selfish. Interviewing is a skill that I really want to work on in practice. So I wanted to create a situation where someone was forced to educate me for free. <laughs> so important. Smart. But, but the second reason is that I'm a huge fan of the on-mic interview as an art form. I think when it's done well, you can learn a lot about interesting people, about artists, about politicians. Yeah. And in some cases, when those interviews are really, really good, I feel like I'm learning about myself a little bit Ooh. too. So I've been on the lookout for someone who's doing interviews really well nowadays so that I could book them on the show. And I came across Sam's podcast and it kind of blew me away. It's really good. So... In your opinion, as uh, they used to say on The Good Wife, what makes Sam and Talk Easy so special? Is it the guests? Is it something about the way Sam leads the conversations? It's both simultaneously. The guests are a big part of it. That's one of the first things you'll notice when you look up the show. Sam books huge A-list guests, even though Sam himself is not a celebrity. And I'm pointing that out because a lot of interview podcasts are hosted by celebrities, yeah, yeah. which makes sense. Like it's a way to guarantee a big audience and you're able to book those A-list guests because your celebrity hosts can call up their friends and book them on the show. Like that makes sense. But yeah. Sam is not a celebrity. He's just a smart thoughtful person who is really, really good at interviewing. And I think that's why he's been able to book these great guests. He's started to have a bit of a reputation. And when you listen to the show, you can tell that the guests are kind of excited to talk to him. Um, you can tell they're comfortable in mm -hmm. his presence and they're willing to open up and be honest with him. So that's why I wanted to talk to him. I think he's doing like... Sorry to the other interview podcasts, but I think he's doing a better job than a lot of his peers who are older and more experienced than him. And I, I just want to just take a moment just to note that obviously present company accepted, right? You're, you're exempting of your course. own host. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Of oh. course. Oh, naturally. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. All right. Will our Slate Plus subscribers get a little extra today? They will. In our Slate Plus segment, I asked Sam to tell me about the producers of Talk Easy ah. and what they bring to the show. Yeah, I know. <laughs> As a producer, I was like, let's give some credit to the, yeah. So the people he, who do it, the work, go ahead, you can say it. Yeah, yeah. And, and he, he does give them a lot of credit and he has some interesting things to say in that segment about collaboration and handing over jobs to other people mm. that you can trust them with. Uh, I also asked Sam about these photo shoots he does with his guests that I think are, are really delightful. And uh, so he told me about that too. 
Amazing. Well, Slate Plus members will hear that extra slice of the conversation at the end of the show. And San Fragoso superfans, you need to hear that. And if you're not a Slate Plus member, it's very easy to join. You'll get exclusive members-only segments, bonus episodes of shows like Slow Burn and Big Mood, Little Mood. You will never hit a paywall on the Slate site, and you'll be supporting the work we do here on Working. To learn more, go to slate.com slash working plus. All right. Now let's listen in on Cameron's conversation with podcast host and interviewer extraordinaire, Sam Fragoso. Sam Fragoso, welcome to Working. Hi, how are you doing? Not too bad. We are in person right now, which Uh is rare for a working interview. Is it? It is. We usually talk to our guests remotely. Mm -hmm. I know that you tend to talk to your guests in person. I do. Yeah. And and you take great pains to do that. You have <laughs> flown to New York to interview someone. Tell I me have. what you can get with an in-person interview that you cannot over Zoom or something. Okay, so I think there are some people that can totally do a Zoom interview. Mhm. Usually people that are okay or comfortable with technology. Mm. If they're like I need help with the MacBook, yeah, it's just a hard place to start an interview because because then I have to spend the first ten minutes being like, "This is where you press the button," and also we have usually sent them mics so that yeah. I'm like walking them through a yeah Scarlet Solo Shore setup, and it's so dumb. Yeah, and by the time we get started, they're like, "I want this to be over." Yeah, and there's some humiliation that happens where people are like i'm embarrassed that i'm not good at the technology Mm -hmm. so i don't like doing any of that yeah so i prefer it in person i mean also you just can't read body language as well it's it's, it's harder to read through zoom yeah and and there's just there's things you pick up right when you walk in that i like to know Mm mm-hmm what are the things that you can pick up on right away in an in-person guest I, i pick up um how polite they are to my team Uh uh-huh i notice i'm like oh okay like they'll ask them their name yeah or or they won't you know do they ask for like eight different drinks yeah (laughs) do you have eight different drinks in your studio yeah whatever they need you do i mean we'll go get it okay our producer caroline reebok or um our associate producer caitlin dryden they will go get whatever newfangled coffee you need yeah we will go do it i also noticed like i don't know posture yeah energy coming in i spend the first few minutes trying to like hold whatever they're going through that day and just try to remove you know all the shit that we come into rooms with yeah i want to try to hold that and get rid of it and then try to settle us in to the conversation and how do you do that when you notice some of the like <laughs> off-putting things that you're looking for say they're a little short with your staff or mm-hmm. y- you're just not getting a, a friendly aura <laughs> from them i i am pretty good at getting us to the place we need to get to usually i'll make dumb jokes mm-hmm. or i'll talk about something in my life briefly because mm-hmm. it's not something i want to do on the show you know we're not a show where to his credit, like Mark Marin, mm-hmm. people sign up for Marin to hear about, you know, his cats and coffee. Uh-huh. I think that's nice. I just am not that interested in sharing that part of my life. I, I don't think it's that interesting. I want to stay on this topic of creating a, a calming atmosphere sort of with the guest. This is something that I think listeners recognize right away. The vibe of the show is calm. And guests admit to being calm. I want to read a a (laughs) tweet that Padma Lakshmi sent out recently. Uh, She was a guest and she said, quote, amidst a sea of interviews for hashtag taste the nation. That's the project she's promoting. uh, The Talk Easy podcast was a standout. Sam Fragoso was able to both calm me down and start a deep and introspective conversation that was totally unexpected 
and completely welcome. I'm not going to take responsibility for her leaving Top Chef. <laughs> I was gonna, I was gonna say it was such an introspective interview that I she know. was like, "I need to change my life." She went. <laughs> <laughs> that was very nice of her to say that. Yeah. yeah. So what is where does that calm come from? Is that part of what you're doing when you're? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Um, I mean, do I seem calm now? Well, no, because I'm picking up on body language and stuff, but. Uh, that that was going to be my other question is you seem calm f- to the listener yeah. to me are you calm in what the tape or in life in the tape i mean it's kind of like if it sounds calm then the answer just there's no other answer yeah. i mean uh-huh w- whether i'm calm eh, no i mean i'm prepared yeah so it's kind of like in the making movies that that book that Cindy Lumet wrote mm-hmm. he always talks about you need to come to the set as prepared as possible with a game plan in mind so that when you get to the set you're willing to throw that game plan away mm-hmm. should the circumstances call for a change and i i basically approach the interview the same way i come with a game plan yeah i come with structure i come with notes and sometimes you get into the room and it's like, you know what's not going to work? Your game plan, your structure, and your notes. Uh-huh. And you have to kind of toss that out yeah. and meet the moment. But I I try to leave my bullshit at the door. It's going to be right there for me when we're done talking. <laughs> it's <laughs> like not it's going not, anywhere. It's not going anywhere. Yeah. But it, does, it can be displaced for an hour. Yeah. So that's kind of how I approach it. Right. So you've done you've done all of your research you to feel prepared and to be prepared. Mm-hmm. Um, when you're sitting down with someone, what is in front of you? What are your actual notes? I go into the room, and I have like my laptop. There's a thing that's it's called the brief that has okay. anything our guest has done mm-hmm. that we could find. It's in there. Yeah, and then. That, and that's a that's on your computer. That's you don't have computer, a printed but not, out. No, no. So like I don't I don't really look at that though. What I have in front of me is um an outline mm-hmm. that's usually like in a three act structure. And that's pretty scripted. Pretty scripted. It's pretty scripted, but I'll I'll deviate from that early and often. Yeah. Um and that's in front of me. Mm-hmm. So that I have you know, most of the beats mapped out. Yeah. And places I know I want to go. Yeah. But that's in front of me. Like, I'm looking at that. And that, so, like, I've worked as a producer primarily. I work with a lot of hosts, and I see people's documents, and everyone does it a little bit differently. Like, Mm -hmm. some people will have, like, every word verbatim, and they will read their questions verbatim. Other people have, like, a sloppy mess, kind of, and Mm -hmm. that's what works for them. Uh, Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm more in the first camp. Okay. It is worded. It is scripted. But I'll find in the moment that what I've scripted is n- nonsense. Uh-huh. And I'll just like throw that out uh-huh. and rewrite on the fly. But I, I, yeah. li- I like to have some of the, the verbiage worked out. Yeah. S- especially w- when we're in, you know, thorny subjects. Like I, I, I want to make sure I get that right. Yeah. Especially if there are uh, like statistics mm-hmm. or quotes that they've given in other interviews. I, I don't want to. Yeah. I, don't, I don't want to be looking for that. Yeah. So yeah. I, right. I have it written out. When you're designing that arc, you know, for a working interview, we have like a kind of a narrow objective where it's narrower than a lot of other podcasts where we're like, okay, we're, we're trying to get the guests to tell us how they do what they do. Mm-hmm. And that acts as sort of like a North star when I'm figuring out what I want to talk to someone about. Um, what is the sort of North Star for Talk Easy? I was just thinking as you were saying that, I was like, that sounds nice. Yeah. <laughs> to have one? A little North Star. It is nice. Yeah, sounds great. I, there's no grand unifying theory Yeah. that I have. It's different for each guest. Yeah. So depending on the guest we're talking about, I could tell you, but I don't, it's like one of those things like I don't know it until I, I do. It presents mm. itself in the research. 
Right. And it definitely presents itself by the time we go to the outline. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, you know, the basic answer is I want to capture the essence of the guest. Yeah. And why they do what they do and how they do what they do. Yeah. But sometimes, you know, that doesn't matter. Yeah. Sometimes we have someone on and they just lost someone. Hmm. And, you know, that's going to be the interview. Like we just had Sarah Silverman on. And you could do an interview that goes something like, what is the state of comedy in these, like, censored, cloistered times? Mm-hmm. You could do that. Mm-hmm. But her dad just died three weeks ago. Yeah. And if you know anything about her, that was like her best friend. Mm -hmm. So to do an interview where we don't talk about that, where it's not kind of the North Star of the interview, to me would be not, it would not be an honest snapshot Mm. of who this person is at this moment. Mm -hmm. And that's the aim of the show. That's the North Star. Yeah, it's who they are right now. Yeah. And when we have guests on that come back, we will often play tapes back to them. Yeah. And you go, oh my God, like with Jenny Slate. We've Uh had her on a few times. Uh-huh. We'll play bits and pieces from the last conversation. Mm. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable how different someone is in three years. And also yeah. it's unbelievable how similar they are too. Yeah. So yeah, yeah I, that, that, I think that's it. I wanted to ask about that. That is a strategy that I see you use often on the show, a really effective one, which is quoting the guest to the guest. Yeah either from a print interview or audio or something. Um, how did you come across that strategy and what, what does it do for you? I don't, I mean, I don't think I, I, I don't think I invented that. I think, no, I don't think so either. Yeah. I think, you know, Terry Gross does a lot of that. Uh huh. I like to do it because I don't want people to tell the same story of their lives. Mm-hmm. I want people to deviate and to get to something that's probably more truthful. And the way you do that is, present them with the past narrative that they've told endless publications. Uh And once you do that, they have no choice but to tell a new story. Wow. It's counterintuitive, sort of, because it seems like, oh, I'm I'm bringing up this other... Like, bringing up something they have already said feels like it's your, your... covering territory that's already been covered or something. But that is actually the thing that leads to something that is the opposite of stale. Absolutely. And I imagine the reason people don't do that as much is because they have the same fear that you Mm. just articulated, which is, well, why would I just be covering the same ground? Yeah. But usually with those quotes, there's something in there that I think has not been explored. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, once you provide that quote and that context, they have to fill it in right? with usually a more lived experience and, and a life that's like they want to they want to share that. Yes. They want to share this. No one's asked them. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be back with more of Cameron's conversation with Sam Fragoso after this. Reboot your credit card with Apple Card, the credit card created by Apple. It gives you unlimited daily cash back that you can now choose to grow in a high yield savings account at 4.15% annual percentage yield. That's more than 10 times higher than the national average savings rate. Apply for Apple Card now in the Wallet app on iPhone and start growing your daily cash with savings today. Apple Card subject to credit approval. Savings is available to Apple Card owners subject to eligibility requirements. Savings accounts provided by Goldman Sachs Bank USA, member FDIC. National average savings rate is from FDIC website. Terms apply. This podcast is brought to you by Slate Studios and Macy's. Hey, y'all, what's up? It's your girl, Lene Vene. I'm a writer, creator, and a changemaker. And the first step in making meaningful change is talking about the really hard things. Did you know that LGBTQ young people are four times more likely to attempt suicide than their peers? Macy's and The Trevor Project are on a mission to change that. 
The Trevor Project is the leading organization doing crisis intervention and mental health work for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning young people. My name is Sophie Good. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a senior corporate partnerships manager at The Trevor Project. The Trevor Project is a suicide prevention organization. The work that we do is very serious and it's very urgent. As much as we see a bright future and see the opportunities to make change, we know that LGBTQ young people are in pain and in danger right now. And support from Macy's empowers us. We've expanded our crisis services from just having the phone line to also having 24-7 service on text and chat. We've increased our lineup of suicide prevention programming as well. Working towards the world we want to create and making sure that we're showing up for young people in this moment is so important. Now's the time to help LGBTQ young people in crisis. This June, Pride Month, when you round up your purchase at Macy's or donate online, you'll help fund the Trevor Project's comprehensive approach to suicide prevention among LGBTQ young people. Find out how Macy's is creating brighter futures for all at Macy's.com slash purpose. Listeners, we want to hear from you. Every other Thursday on Working Overtime, we answer listener questions. So please tell us your creative challenges and let us help you. Drop us a line at working at slate.com. You can, and in fact, we would love you to send us a voice memo to that address, or you can give us a ring at 304-933-WORK. And if you're enjoying this episode, don't forget to subscribe to Working wherever you get your podcasts. Now back to Cameron's conversation with Sam Fragoso. On your 150th episode of Talk Easy, your friend Harrison interviewed you. Oh. And you said something very quickly that wasn't really like explored that much. Mm. But you said... Look at you. <laughs> I know. I'm, I'm, I'm using one of your tactics here. Talk Easy, me. You said, quote, interviewing lives and dies by the follow-up question. <laughs> What are you looking for when you're looking for a follow-up? I think that's true. I I still think that's true. Yeah. I'm looking for someone to stop lying. That's oh. what I'm looking for. I'm looking for someone to be honest. Uh-huh. That's the whole point of this of this thing is to get to the truth of the matter, to get to the essence of the person and what they believe in. And yeah. people say all kinds of things that I think are profoundly untrue. That, ah. that, that I think I think that people not because not because they're malicious. There's not like they're not nefarious. It's just that we move through this world to move through it, and the easiest way to move through it is to say the same stuff, to say the mm. things that will get to get you to point A to point B, and so the follow up question is a way to um, make a pit stop between A and B for me. Yeah. So that's why I think it does live and die with the follow-up question. Because how many shows do you listen to and you go, Jesus, they just said three interesting things. Ask about one of them. Yeah. Uh-huh. It drives me nuts. I, so yeah. I mean, that that's why I'm making the show. If yeah. I felt like there was an abundance of other shows that did interviews well the way I like them, I wouldn't do Talk Easy. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't... Because there are a lot of them. Yeah. There are quite the, a few there out are, there. There's no shortage of shows. Yeah. But there is a shortage of good shows. Yeah. And if I ever felt like the market had a lot of shows that were better, then I would I would do something else. Yeah. But I don't feel yeah. that way. The because thing- of the follow-up question. <laughs> yes. And, and, and like now you the, ask your follow up question. The thing that you're doing that y- you say others are, are not quite as good at is maybe recognizing the non truths or the putting up a wall or the, the answer that you feel like you can pick at to get to something more truthful. I, I, I'm not saying that. Other people don't do that. Yeah, yeah. I, just, I don't mean I just we don't do, I just it. do it in my way. Yeah. And I like the way I do it. I don't always like the way I do it. But um, I just want to know how you do it. Like, how are you detecting when someone's not being as forthcoming as 
you think they are possibly willing to be with some coaxing. It's just funny. It's like, this is how I move through life. Yeah. It's not, it's not a gimmick on yeah. the show. Yeah. Like, I don't walk out of here and go, hmm, can't read people anymore. It's like, <laughs> I, I... And you don't hook them up to a polygraph test where you're like, oh, there's... Um, I can't confirm or deny that, but... <laughs> Uh, yeah, we don't we don't have the budget for that. Yeah. One. By the way, people have lied on Talk Easy. Uh-huh. People have probably lied on the show, and I didn't even know they were lying. Yeah. I still to this day don't know yeah. that they're lying. But also I wanna I wanna move away from like the lying, not lying thing because yeah. like we're not this isn't an interrogation show. We no. talk <laughs> No, it's, it's not. like it's like the show like has a lot of writers i mean we we do we do shows we do episodes with poets yeah like there are times when we have a politician on or someone that i think wields a great deal of power that i feel more inclined to push and prod yeah they owe the truth in a different way than a poet does yeah but like when we're talking with someone like a sarah silverman it's not that essential that I continue to prod into her childhood. Yeah. Like, you get what you get. Yeah. Sometimes you should push further. There's something you think is important or interesting. Yeah. But if someone goes, I'm good on that. Yeah. Then I'll move on. Yeah. And I tell everyone before, it's like, if I get something wrong, tell me and I'm going to do it again. And if we get to a spot that you don't like great let's move on yeah that doesn't yeah. happen that often though because i can i can usually tell yeah if yeah. someone doesn't like something like it's not that yeah you know sometimes they'll they'll say something like let's talk about something else yeah or that was not a good question really you've gotten that was not a good question i mean from like one or two guests yeah but i mean you know you can't stop brian de palma you know uh -huh. well he's gonna say what he's gonna say yeah uh-huh. <laughs> some, uh, some Brian De Palma shots. Yeah. He just caught a stray on the working podcast. I, I guess so. Some people are more curmudgeonly. Yeah. Let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah. Some course. people you can't convince to be there with you. And that's a bummer. But I'm still going to watch and love Blowout. Like, I still like Carlito's way. It's okay that yeah. he was a little curmudgeonly with me. Yeah, I do wonder what it's like when when someone's not there with you. I can, I, I, I usually can fix it. It's you can fix it? Oh, I can usually fix it, yeah. Uh -huh. It'll take like 25 minutes. Fixing it meaning you'll get them there yeah. with you. Yeah. yeah. We have to talk for an hour. Yeah. Like, it's harder to not be there than it is to be there. Yeah. So like, if your interview with someone is like a 20 minute, 30 minute thing, like I came up when I started doing interviews for, for, for publications, they would give you like seven minutes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And you go, what can be accomplished in seven minutes? And then you learn very quickly, basically nothing. Yeah. But the show, the minimum requirement is that they have to talk for an hour. Yeah. We don't do anything less than that. I won't do anything less than that. Cause yeah. it's just not, it's not going to work. Yeah. So I find that people generally go, uh, I could put up a fight, but the guy seems like vaguely nice and he's clearly done a lot of research. Yeah. And I think that's another thing. When you've demonstrated that you've put a lot of time into something, people yeah. want to show up for that. Yeah. Yeah. It's easier for them when they go into an interview and they see, well, this person hasn't really done a lot of work for this. Then you can be flippant. Yeah. Then you can be dismissive because what are you dismissing? You're dismissing someone not prepared. Yeah. To dismiss someone They're like me, you in the first place, it's, kind you're, of. You're you're an asshole if you yeah. do that. People have guilt. Yeah. I want to ask you about a couple of things that I find challenging as a less experienced interviewer. <laughs> um, I had a mentor describe interviewing in this way one time. He said, "Like your mind." needs to work on two tracks uh, like on one track you're listening very very closely mm -hmm. and on the other track you're kind of deciding where to go next maybe you're looking at your notes i find those tracks 
difficult to manage sometimes. Or when I leave the listening track, I feel like I'm taking my hand off the wheel for a second mm. to like do something else. Uh, how do you manage those tracks? Why is that hard for you? I think it's a multitasking deficiency I have. Like I, uh, <laughs> it is, it's like, um, it's hard. Like I am, I can't do two things at the same time. 100%. So no one can, if I'm listening like multitasking is not real. Like, do people know that by now? I hope so. Like, it makes me feel a lot better. It's not a, that we're it's not a that. real thing. Yeah. When I'm looking at my notes, when I'm thinking about where to go next, mm -hmm. I'm listening a little bit worse. Yeah. And it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, there's no way around that. You're not going to be fully present. By the way, people have been, since the beginning of man, tried to be present. Yeah. There are cottage industries around presence. Yeah. <laughs> it's really hard. Yeah. It's really hard. It's really hard not on mic. Yeah. So it's even harder when on mic. Yeah. So you have to give yourself some grace and some credit for trying. That's all you can do is try. Or you could be a hack uh -huh. And just go, I'm going to read these questions. I'm really looking forward to lunch. <laughs> um, can you be quicker and more concise yeah. so that I can go to the five guys downstairs? Yeah. You could do that. And I many could. people in this industry do do that. And they're not good at their job. It makes the follow-ups impossible for one thing. Well, they don't want to do follow-ups. Yeah. You have to remember, like, a lot of people do things they don't like to do for work. <laughs> sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I like what I do. Yeah. It is a great joy. Yeah. That fight to be present, to keep the two tracks going, it's one that I enjoy getting in the ring for. Yeah. And I'm happy to do that. Yeah. And I'll fall short. But I'll fall short at least trying to do something that I think when it works, is incredible. Yeah. But it's not always going to work. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But you're not going to be able to be fully present. And it's not your job to be. Your job is to guide. Mm. And to show up for the guest. Mm -hmm. And you have to do both simultaneously. Yeah. You mentioned this a little bit earlier. Um, and it's something I've noticed as a listener, that you are really good at getting out of the guest's way. You let them speak, and then you have these moments every once in a while where you do insert yourself, and it's it's wonderful. You come in and you provide some sort of framing where you're almost helping the guest learn about themselves as we are learning about the guest, too. Mm. And in fact, I want to listen to a short clip here of... Really? Um, this is from your interview with Michelle Williams, who was so happy to talk to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You often come back to this line about not exactly knowing where you were going, not being clear about the destination. And yet it dawned on me, and maybe I'm just an outsider looking in. We don't know each other, right? But it dawned on me that like an 18-year-old did know they should go do a strange play by Tracy Letts in New York City at 18 years old in 1999. That means something. That's not a common choice. Thank you. Many people would have done the gun-toting cheerleaders. Thank you. That's all I can say. That's such a kind, that's such, such a kind um, thing to say to me and such a kind observation to make. I can only say thank you. So it's not important for the listener to know everything that was being referred to right there, but how do you decide when to jump in with something like that? That that was a good job by you. Oh, yeah, thanks. Good pull. You picked something that doesn't happen in every episode uh -huh. because it doesn't need to happen. In every episode. Right. But sometimes the guest requires it. And what you're hearing there is me basically taking Michelle Williams and just kind of like, 
and I mean this truly, it was a virtual interview. Yeah. Oh. So I'm, I'm like shaking her a little bit. Yeah. And I'm saying like, you're all right. Uh-huh. Stop being so fucking hard on yourself. Life is really hard. Yeah. And I'm just giving her the permission to go, I'm all right. Yeah. And sometimes you need to do that because we're not always great at seeing how we move through the world. And I think you sometimes need an, an outside source to collect the information and to say, however you're feeling in this moment, it's totally valid and, and fair. And you can be hard on yourself. But the decisions that she made in that case, there were choices made that a young artist who could have given up at every turn had something in them to go, I need to do this project. I need to move to this city. Yeah. And she wasn't giving herself credit. Right. And I was willing to cross the line from interviewer to human being mm -hmm. to say, no, you ought to give yourself some credit. Yeah. And there are some schools of journalism that will say that's crossing a line. Yeah. Yeah. It's not your job to answer for the guests. Yes. Kind and of. I think that's, that's fine. People can do it like that. Mm -hmm. But I'm here to be a person with, with someone. Mm -hmm. And I have found that if I show up as a human being, defects and all, that they're more willing to be themselves, defects and all. Mm -hmm. I don't know Michelle Williams. Yeah. Never met her in my life. But my heart broke in pockets of that conversation. And maybe there are some journalists that go, your heart can break, but don't put it on mic. Don't show them your cards. Fuck that. That's a waste of time to me. Don't, we are yeah. going to die. <laughs> and I'm not going to get to the end of this and go, God, if only I played it tighter, closer to the chest. With me. Give me a break. It's yeah. not that important. Yeah. What's important is that you show up for someone. And yeah. the only way I know how to do that is to show up for them. And that means like, I'm not going to have that barrier. Yeah. And that's a great pull that you, that you had there because that's some, um, that was a hard moment. Yeah. But it completely opened the interview. Yeah. The moment I said that, listen to the tape. For anyone who like wants to hear that episode, it's one of my favorites. It's a really good one. Yeah. After I said that, the floodgates opened. Yeah. And we got to what matters to her. Yeah. And sometimes the person needs permission. Yeah. Sometimes you need to tell the person, you're all right. Yeah. Does it always work? No. Is it always required? Definitely not. I'm not saying it's the right way. I'm saying it's my way. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. funny. I feel like you did for her what you did for me when you said, you're not going to listen 100% and that's okay. Yeah. Or you have just one human brain and I shouldn't beat myself up about it. Um, that was the aim. I that, mean, I don't know if it will help. I hope it does. It does. Or I, I'm just calling attention to the fact that that can, like, bring down the temperature or, like, it, it really feels like, like tension is released in that moment when, mm -hmm. when you give that gift to someone. The same way that the tension was released when you played the, the Michelle Williams clip. Because mm -hmm. it made me feel like, oh, he really listens. Mm -hmm. It's nice to be seen and heard. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants that. Yeah. Like, that's why we do these things. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think you're doing a good job. Thanks. You all right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, What's going on? No, nothing. I <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I became emotional for a second there. Um, what, what were you going to just now? I was like, I was just flashing back to the, um, like what I was doing when I was preparing for this interview, like listening to lots of episodes of the show. And you were like in my living room with me and I was spending a lot of time with you because I like, I think your work is valuable. And 
I don't know. Like when you said that in that moment, I was, I just felt like that was the right thing to do. I was like spending my time in a meaningful way. And I, I focus on the nerves a lot of the time, you know, that crowds out my enjoyment of things sometimes. You, you don't do this work. There is no way of doing good work without those nerves. Because if you don't have the nerves, then, like, you're not really putting anything into the table here. Like, you're not yeah. investing much. You're only nervous about things you care about. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, it, the nerves, you have to find some way to reframe why they're there. They're there because you care. Yeah. And so long as you know that, then at some point you're able to put that down to keep them at bay enough you know to do the interview because like i said we're gonna walk out your shit's gonna come right back to you <laughs> yeah and it's not going anywhere yeah that's but, true but you know i think that's good to feel nervous it's good to feel anxious it means you care it does and it does the, yeah. the, there's nothing i think there's nothing sadder than folks who wade through life never really feeling that in the things that they spend their time doing yeah. and not everyone and that's okay like not not, not not everyone wants that kind of life right where they pour themselves into the work yeah. or career yeah but i don't know i like it yeah it works for me sam fragoso thanks for coming on working cameron drews a pleasure When we come back, Cameron and I will dig deeper into the idea that nerves or even anxiety can help an artist do better work. This episode is brought to you by Bank of America. If you own or operate a business, whether it's a local operation or a global corporation, partnering with Bank of America could be your smartest move. By teaming with Bank of America, you'll enjoy exclusive digital tools, award-winning insights, and business solutions so powerful, you'll make every move matter. Position your business to capitalize on opportunity in a moment's notice. Visit bankofamerica.com slash bankingforbusiness to learn more. What would you like the power to do? Bank of America N.A. Copyright 2023. At the end of your first year, Discover credit cards automatically double all the cash back you've earned. That's right. Everything you earned doubled. All the cash back from eating at your favorite soup dumpling restaurant doubled. All the cash back from that trip where you sort of learned to snowboard also doubled. And the best part, you don't have to do anything ridiculous to get it. Nope. Discover does it automatically. Seriously, though, see terms and check it out for yourself at discover.com slash match. First, Cameron that was a really, really lovely conversation to listen in on. As someone who conducts about 20 of these on mic conversations with a stranger every year, I learned a lot, especially about the need to make an emotional connection with a guest and not to be embarrassed mm. about trying to do that. Like It really helps you get things from people that are interesting and revealing. Yeah. I was also really touched by your interaction with Sam about the anxiety you were feeling in the interview, which really felt like yeah. it was the anxiety of still feeling like you have room to improve in a particular skill. Um, Correct. I, <laughs> <laughs> I was reminded of a quote from Ira Glass. Uh, he said, All of us who do creative work, like, you know, we get into it and we get into it because we have good taste. And you get into this thing that, that I don't even know how to describe, but it's like there's a gap that for the first couple of years that you're making stuff, what you're making isn't so good, okay? It's not that great. It's, it's really not that great. It's, it's trying to be good. It has ambition to be good, but it's not quite that good. But your taste, the thing that got you into the game, your, your taste is still killer. And your taste is good enough that you can tell that what you're making is kind of a disappointment to you. You know what I mean? Like, you can tell that it's still sort of crappy. Okay, thank you, Ira. Now, I want to be clear, first of all, Cameron, that you are not a beginner, as everyone who just heard that interview knows, you're a really sensitive, graceful interviewer. And oh, as anyone you. who regularly listens to the show knows, you're an amazing producer and editor. 
but you've listened to a lot of interviews. You've heard the very best stuff. And after that, it's hard to feel confident that you're living up to your own high standards. Yes. But I agree with Sam that the most important thing is to give a damn, even if that does up the anxiety level. So with a week or so of distance since you had that conversation, have you had any more thoughts about what you were feeling at that point in the interview? Do you agree that nerves can be a kind of positive indicator and can help people do better work? Yeah, I have had time to think about it. And I think the thing that really got me was just that moment when he said he thought I was doing a good job. Wow. And when I was preparing for this interview, that's what I was worried about. That's where the anxiety is, is mm. will I do a good job? Will I not do a good job? And I think what you're hearing there, bringing it back to the Ira Glass thing, mm. is you're hearing in real time my work living up to my taste. Or yeah. like I'm feeling like it, like that's happening in the moment which just doesn't happen very often. And I think I was, I was overwhelmed by that. Oh. And, um, you know, I've done interviews before. This isn't my first one. And often I walk away and I think that was okay, but it wasn't my best. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you're right. I know what an A plus interview sounds like. Yeah. And I know, I know when I've done a B or a B plus, minus interview and and knowing the difference is important but i think i think this letter grade thing <laughs> can be yeah. can be the cause of anxiety yes. this is the thing yes. is like it's a it's a give and take uh because this can lead to perfectionism and getting your standards sky high mm -hmm. and, and that's what creates anxiety in the moment and anxiety in the moment will sabotage you yeah like it it will mess you up yeah. um anxiety is is a self-conscious thing and when you're in an interview scenario you can't be thinking about you you have to be listening you have to be present so what i tried to do before this interview was you know i i, I told myself i'm going into this thing prepared yep and I'm going to be present mm -hmm. and I'm going to listen when Sam is talking. And if something goes a little wrong, that's okay. But if yeah. I have those bases covered, I think it's much harder to fail spectacularly. And then once it's over, you can go back and be like, that was a B minus. But <laughs> don't think this is a B minus. Oh, shit. Yeah. In the middle. No. If you can help it. Yeah, I get that. But. Cameron, you are a producer, and that mm -hmm. means you hear everything. You hear the unvarnished truth, all the interviewers' faults and bad techniques, <laughs> and then you get to fix them. Thank you so much. Um, but what do we yeah. get wrong? What do we do wrong? And having listened to so many interviews, do you think that there's anything a host can do when a guest just isn't giving them anything, either because they're nervous or they've done too many interviews on a particular topic or... Maybe they're just dull. I mean, what can you do? Can you, is there any, I just want a magic formula, Cameron. Give it to me. <laughs> Normally, I, I would have absolutely nothing for you <laughs> if you asked me this a month ago. But I feel like I, I've sort of, in all of my research and the time I've spent with Sam, I feel like I've taken a little course on <laughs> interviewing wow. or something. Wow. Uh, I'm going to try to answer this. I mean, it, it's really hard. As a producer, I see it all the time when, like, you know, the, the guest isn't quite giving the host what the host wants and the mm. tape just isn't very good. As far as, like, what to do about that, <laughs> using what I've learned over the past two weeks, like, I guess you want to be as patient as possible. Yeah. Even say, like, take your time. You know, mm. um, I think if Sam were answering this question, I don't want to speak for him, but based on what I have learned about how he does these things, like he might say, like, go ahead and and ask them why they're getting stuck. Yeah. In, in a polite way. Yeah. Just sort of, you know, 
find the tension and and like interrogate it a little bit. Interrogate's the wrong word. Gently investigate it. Yeah. That was how I felt in the presence of Sam. Whenever <laughs> I like expressed some sort of anxiety or something, he'll just be like, "What? What's going on?" <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> like tell me, like what? What are you going through? Um, if there's a way that you can do that, and you've sort of established a, a setting or environment with the guest where you're comfortable doing something like that, mm -hmm. that might work. I don't know. I, am I making sense? You totally are. Yes, you absolutely <laughs> are. I think, yeah, I mean, making them feel comfortable, making them, like, just reducing as much anxiety on their part as you can. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's the only thing you can do, I think. Now, I guess I have to address your other question where I critique the working <laughs> hosts live <laughs> on mic. Uh, I'll, I'll narrow in on just one thing that is like, like every host I work with has problems with this a little bit. You know, one thing I do a lot of a, as a producer is I cut questions down. Yeah. The raw questions can be kind of long. And I have been thinking hard about what's going on there. Yeah. And I think one thing is all four people who have hosted working are really polite Ruman, Karen, you and Isaac are all like really polite. And I think politeness leads to longer questions with little qualifying phrases that are like, maybe this is a silly <laughs> question or like, I bet you get asked this a lot or like things that sort of like pad it out that almost apologize for the question yeah. as the question is happening. Um, you're also all critics. So mm -hmm. sometimes there is like you guys have all these smart ideas that are sometimes folded into the question. Sometimes there's all this like brilliant analysis <laughs> that is great. And sometimes I leave it in there. And sometimes I listen to the whole thing and I'm like, we just need the question. <laughs> like I'm going to get rid of all of the brilliance and make way for the guest a little bit. Yeah. And, and there's one final thing that I've noticed recently. I think, I think this has been a thing forever, but I just recently sort of like identified it and put a name to it, which is the tendency that hosts have to start answering the question yes. for the guest. Yeah. So say the question is, what's your favorite color, right? The host will be like, so what's your favorite color? Is it like, are you kind of a blue person or are we more on the red, yeah. orange side of the spectrum? Like like don't do any of that you don't need that don't give them like a multiple choice yeah. question all you need is what's your favorite color and then stop silence and then see what they do with the silence and they'll maybe they'll say some color you've never heard of before <laughs> or something like and then uh, and then you pounce in with a follow-up question i have to tell you cameron there are two th i have two thoughts about that the first thing is yeah. uh number one that's a really good point that I hear a lot, and it's, some, it's a reason that I think hosts should always listen to their shows mm, or should mm -hmm. always listen to their interviews. Because I, first of, the second point I wanted to make, I did that at the top of the show. I said, why is Sam so good? Is it uh -huh. because of this? Is it because of that? Uh, and I heard myself <laughs> do it as, I, as it was coming out of my mouth. Um, ah. But I think that's something that you can be aware of and you can stop doing. But if you don't have an awareness like a lot of things. It, it, it feels like a natural way to speak. It feels, you know, like you're helping them, but you're not, you're yeah. not helping them at all. You're just getting in the way. So uh, yeah, I, I fully, I fully hear you and I will, I will take that on board. All right. All right, that's all the time we have for today's show. And just a reminder that Slate Plus members get to hear exclusive segments, entire bonus episodes of shows like Slow Burn and Big Mood, Little Mood, and they get full access to all the wonder that is Slate.com. You can sign up today at Slate.com slash Working Plus. Thank you to Sam Fragoso for being our guest this week. An extra thanks to my favorite producer, Cameron Drews, who, as you have all just heard, is also an amazing host and interviewer. Oh, thank you, June. Uh, another quick thank you to Emily Cherish for engineering this interview. It was a huge help. Thank you, Emily. We'll be back next week with June's conversation with Talia Lempert, an artist who specializes in portraits of bicycles. Until then... Get back to work.
This episode is brought to you by Bank of America. If you own or operate a business, whether it's a local operation or a global corporation, partnering with Bank of America could be your smartest move. By teaming with Bank of America, you'll enjoy exclusive digital tools, award-winning insights, and business solutions so powerful, you'll make every move matter. Position your business to capitalize on opportunity in a moment's notice. Visit bankofamerica.com slash bankingforbusiness to learn more. What would you like the power to do? Bank of America, N.A., copyright 2023. Hey, everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe. No.